go. And I'll present our speaker. So Andrea Komlozzi is professor at the University, the Department of Economics and Social History at the University of Vienna. Um, she has published on labor, migration, border, and uneven development on a regional European and global context. She published a book in 2014 that was translated in 2018 and published at Verso. It is entitled Work the Last Thousand Year and has a pretty yellow cover, as you can see. It will be the subject of today's conference. Without further ado, I will pass uh, the presentation to Professor Kamlozi. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you for inviting me <laughs> on a transatlantic <laughs> event <laughs> in this uh, format. It's nice uh, to listen to your uh, English with a French accent. Now you will have to move uh, to listening to English with a German accent. <laughs> Uh, so we are in the same position. I mean, maybe you are in an advantage because you are living in a bilingual country. But nevertheless, uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 an honor for me uh, to do that. Uh, so I will give you a brief, uh, comprehensive introdu introduction in that book. Uh, in English, it has the title "A Thousand Years." In German, uh, it's it's uh, the subtitle is. Uh, work from a global historical perspective from the 13th to the 21st century, which is more correct. Uh, so the thousand years are a little bit an exaggeration by Verso, but obviously they thought uh, it would be selling better if more years are included. Uh, it Just a little anecdote, uh, when they offered me, I mean, when they proposed this title to me, uh, their first proposal were, was the first thousand years. And after a while, I thought to myself, which first thousand years do they have in mind? <laughs> when do they start counting? Uh, so finally, we agreed on that title. But uh, anyhow, that's uh, that's also the title for this uh, for this talk. Uh, and I will uh, introduce me at the beginning into my understanding of work. Uh, uh, I include all forms of, of work activity and divide them according to the receiving framework. Uh, uh, I mean, we got used to this uh, 19th century Western conception of work to reduce it to gainful employment. Uh, but that contrasts with work experience of most people in, in the world. And uh, so I decided to have a, uh, a, a broader definition of work uh, that has always consisted in various forms. Uh, uh, and they, this, these manifestations were combined during the life course in the of, of, of a person in households and also in trans-regional commodity chains. So uh, it's a, a, a simple concept. So I look at uh, labor for the market. Uh, so I call it commodified labor. Then work for subsistence, uh, for direct use, usually without money. So I call that reciprocal work, work although I'm aware that in some cases, uh, work for a collective or a community can be a reciprocal work, although it is uh, remunerated. Uh, so commodified, reciprocal. And then there's a third uh, uh, category that I introduce. It's the work that is tributed to a political power or state. Uh, that can be a nobility or a tax state, depending on the time period we are looking at. So I call that tributary work. It won't play a major role in, in my presentation today. Uh, I do not see a linear development from reciprocal to commodified work, uh, but my main point is that uh, we face varying combinations in time and space. Uh, of course, if we want to analyze the various <laughs> manifestations of work, we need more categories, which I also uh, explain in more detail in, in my book. Uh, I do not uh, comment uh, on them now. Uh, it's, it's you see, it's tandem terms like, for instance, self-employed and employed, uh, but they do not necessarily represent antagonisms, but they are manifestations that are combined with each other, uh, although in some moments of history and also in certain regions, one or the other can be uh, predominant. But I will also come back to this, uh, to this, to some of these uh, 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 
categories uh, for analysis. To begin with, I would like to uh, present you the, let's say, the standard Eurocentric narrative in a very brief way. And uh, uh, I mean, you are social scientists and no historians, so uh, I, uh, for the moment I won't uh, dive into into history too much and be be very brief and in general uh, uh, the book that the aim of the book is to to let's say to uh, deconstruct this eurocentric narrative but nevertheless uh, we have to know it uh, and uh, it's not completely false but the problem is that it's only one perspective uh, but that became very dominating uh, so I start with very brief to, to, to look at Greek and Roman antiquity, uh, which is characterized by a great disdain of work. Yeah? Uh, work is something uh, uh, every honorable person tries not to come in touch with it uh, and to rely on praxis, uh, to be freed from labor uh, and dive into politics or philosophy or theater or, or whatever. Uh, uh, of course, other people have to do the work. Uh, uh, the Christian Middle Ages see a, a different, uh, give a, big, a, a, a different picture, uh, because this hard, painful labor is not disdained anymore. It is transformed into a virtue. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it can also be dedicated to God when uh, contemplating and when praying. Yeah? Uh, so that is uh, that is a new uh, manifestation of work. And then, of course, uh, in the Middle Ages, w with the rise of uh, of towns and also of uh, urban crafts, uh, the, the, there is a vocational identity of artisans. Uh, that have a positive image of work uh, and related with their creativity and the control of the work product. Yeah? Uh, so we have this tension between the painful character of work and the creative character of work embedded into a society that uh, that uh, uh, that is, let's say, dominated by also by the religious idea that the vita contemplativa uh, is above the vita act activa. Yeah? Uh, I jump into the age of mercantilism, capitalism, without uh, uh, dating it precisely. Uh, my point here is that this tension uh, that we had in the Middle Ages between painful labor and creativity combined with leisure uh, now is leveled. Uh, it's a more uniform uh, idea of work. Uh, uh, work is everything which is done for the benefit of utility. Yeah, wealth and happiness, of course, seen from the side of the uh, consolidating state power, and of course also of the uh, of, of of enterprise uh, that uh, that uh, that is active on, on on growing and expanding markets. Yeah? Uh, so uh, uh, the capitalist enterprise, we we could say, yeah? uh, and then of course this capitalist enterprise. Uh, uh, brings along uh, a lot of of, uh, of painful of painful work and and, and hard work uh, almost or sometimes uh, indeed killing people or, or making their life very short uh, and miserable uh, and this critique of industrial capitalism uh, is uh, reactivating uh, the tension between painful labor and creativity. Yeah. It, it is translated into the antagonism between alienation, yeah, so the dark side of work, if you want, and the self-realization uh, by Hegel and then uh, by Marx. Yeah. Uh, but these philosophers, but also the political economists, uh, when they discuss work very extensively then in the 19th century, uh, usually they just uh, discuss uh, commodified work. Yeah. Uh, and so I ask myself, how did reciprocal work disappear from the history of work? Yeah. So if I go back into history, I see that the family household has been a unit of living and working for the longest time. Yeah. Uh, 
of course, in many facets, and it's 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 uh, you, you cannot really generalize it because there are so many cultural and, and regional differences, and also in, in, in different periods of time. But nevertheless, I would say uh, there was an undivided income from commodified and reciprocal labor. Yeah? Uh, it, it was not necessarily undivided uh, among the members of a household, but there was no division between the commodified and the reciprocal aspect of labor. Yeah? Uh, if you uh, produced, let's say, eggs uh, to pr consume them in a household, uh, it was exactly the same work that had to be done uh, uh, as if you wanted to uh, to, to, to sell them on the, on the market. Yeah? And those eggs that were produced in that family household, they, they, they went to the, <laughs> to, to the dish or to the community festival as they went on the market. Yeah? And there was a complementary cooperation of household members uh, according to gender, age, and life course. So there's nothing to romanticize, but uh, but this cooperation is very important to see, uh, and also the fact that people only could, could exist in households. Yeah? Uh, and if people didn't have a household, uh, it was uh, difficult to survive, or households had to be replaced by other collectives, for instance, uh, 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 monasteries or, or so. Yeah? And then at a certain moment, uh, uh, if from my, uh, uh, of uh, I mean, Western experience, of course, I think more or less of the, uh, to, to the uh, of the term turn of uh, from the 18th to the 19th century. Uh, but this this didn't take place uh, uh, at the same moment all over the world. Uh, the separation of workplace and living place, because the family household was a workplace and a living place at the same time, but as soon as the workplace moved out of the household, yeah, uh, house and subsistence work were no longer per perceived as work. Yeah? And family work, of course, went on, but it was ascribed to women as their natural ded dedication. Yeah? And then uh, uh, it, it is also quite interesting to see that uh, uh, this uh, definition of a housewife's work as something which is not uh, uh, perceived as work uh, uh, was transferred to all kinds of unpaid work also uh, uh, when it was uh, performed by by men uh, uh, by men yeah? and then I, I look at the scientific technical revolution yeah? uh, and of course I, I could say it in the plural because scientific technical revolutions uh, take place uh, all the time yeah? uh, at the beginning, I, I, I think, of course, of the age of, uh, of, of, of machinery in the 19th century, uh, uh, when, it, when, it, when the idea was to dominate nature uh, and to, to uh, mechanize work and, uh, and to liberate uh, people from hard work by the introduction of machinery. Uh, we but we could, can also uh, uh, transfer it in our times and, and, and not only see uh, uh, steam and steam uh, power looms, for instance, or, uh, but we can, of course, also uh, look at the digital uh, machinery, artificial intelligence, robots, and so on. Yeah? So, uh, but this scientific technological revolution, again, it didn't conceive care and subsistence work as work, so it was neglected in that discussion. Uh, and it was neglected as well in concepts of liberation from work, in concepts of exploitation, as in concepts of emancipation through work. So those who wanted to get rid from work didn't think that care and subsistence somehow had to be carried out. No? In, uh, those who blamed exploitation or even uh, didn't think of uh, unpaid work uh, as a subject and object of exploitation too. No? And those who thought that work would uh, be the ultimate uh, method of realizing men, men's and women's uh, uh, identity, they didn't think that also care and subsistence could be such a way of, uh, of, of emancipation. Yeah? Now I show you <laughs> two uh, cliches, if you want, two, uh, two, uh, two uh, stereotypes of work, but uh, uh, 
uh, I mean, it's already photographed, so they uh, <laughs> they are they show real work, uh, but maybe in a, a, a not a very realistic way. But anyhow, uh, with this slide, uh, which uh, uh, which is from a, a weaving uh, household in in Tyrol, uh, home weaving household in Tyrol, uh, I want to underline this. Uh, uh, unity of, 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 of family members uh, in the who, who work and live in the household. We do not see the living room, but we see that that, uh, for instance, child care is uh, integrated into that uh, working uh, situation. And the next slide, uh, it's it's the other the other stereotype, if you want. Uh, so, what is real work? It's a picture of steel works, a male factory working. Uh, a, a, a male factory worker. Yeah? Uh, so everybody would clearly define him as a worker, uh, while in this picture, maybe the weaver would be identified as a worker, uh, uh, but the woman would rather be identified as a housewife uh, uh, who gives uh, some helping hands, uh, uh, but is dedicated to, to the care of, of, of the children. Yeah? So uh, this uh, supports uh, my ideas, about my let's say my feminist and at the same time global uh, conclusions or findings. Yeah? Uh, uh, I see that a reducing work to to employment yeah, follows a male proletarian perception, and it is devaluating non-paid and reciprocal work. Yeah? Housework and specifically housewives' work, uh, uh, as, a, as the main reciprocal work, is, is made invisible. And this invisibility is the precondition for the devaluation and the appropriation of that work. Yeah? Because it, this reciprocal work is, exclude, is excluded from value creation. Yeah? Uh, and as there is no value, there is nothing to appropriate. Uh, it is available at no costs. Uh, I think that this is at the origin of the discrimination of female wage labor, uh, which is discussed under the label of gender pay gap until today. Uh, uh, because this devaluation of unpaid female work is reflected in lower female wages because of this male breadwinner concept where, of course, women work, but it's only considered as a supplement and therefore doesn't uh, deserve the same uh, wage because the main dedication of, of women is to be uh, uh, wives and, 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 and mothers. Yeah? So I think this gender perception is very helpful in, in, in analyzing uh, the, the, the work yeah? and it, it, it leads me to, to the claim that all kinds of work and labor uh, has to be uh, have to be included into uh, the discussion of, of, of work yeah? household wage labor family uh, uh, life course uh, and also interfirm combinations with all their spatial differences and combinations yeah? mm -hmm. uh, it's also quite important to see that uh, it, uh, this leads to a global perception because work in this limited uh, definition of gainful employment is a rather recent phenomenon in history, and it is only introduced into the global south along with European colonialism uh, uh, and was disqualifying reciprocal work, not only of housewives, but of all reciprocal workers, uh, wherever you found them. Let me just show a brief uh, uh, look. Uh, at, at, at the language, because the language is reflecting the dual character of work uh, very well, and it allows to make a difference between toil and fulfillment. Uh, uh, in, so our language here is, is English, so we have this uh, uh, pair of labor and work. We have it in German with Arbeit and Werk, uh, uh, and uh, in French with Travail, Labeur, uh, and Oeuvre all building up on, on the Greek and, uh, or, uh, and then on the, on the, on the Latin uh, uh, pair of, 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 of looking, looking at, this, uh, at, at, at this, this task either as uh, toil or uh, 
as uh, fulfillment. Huh? Uh, labor, of course, is the painful and hard work. It is, it, it is identified with wage labor, uh, also with alienated labor, uh, exploited labor. Uh, but then, of course, when the labor class, the working class, uh, comes into being, it can also turn into a class conscious uh, uh, identity of, of a proletarian uh, with a positive uh, uh, understanding of, of this type of labor. Yeah? On the other hand, work is, is uh, uh, related with handicraft, with creative work, with the vocation to work. Yeah? And then in a, in a more general sense, it, it represents autonomous work as opposed to alienated labor. Yeah? So if I present it like this, it looks very easy. If we go into details also in how these terms are, are used in, the, in, in, in everyday language, but also in analytic language, then we see it's much more complicated because various layers of, 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 this, of, of the use of these terms uh, uh, crisscross each other uh, and, and uh, sometimes it's not so easy to, to make this distinction. Uh, but or already the fact that the language allows to, to, to differentiate bet between these different uh, types of labor, I think that is already telling in a, in a sense. Yeah? This table just shows you in some other languages uh, this uh, distinction between the hard, painful work and labor and and the creative work that is linked to, to workmen shift. Uh, uh, and it can make, uh, it can of course be, uh, uh, I mean, it's just some examples. So I come to my, to my method uh, of investigation, which I, which I apply in the, in, 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 in the book. Uh, 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 sorry. Yeah, so I work with entanglements of work and labor relation. Uh, and then I have to define the situations uh, and constellations at which I look. So I look at trade, at transregional commodity chains and on, on migration primarily. Yeah? So transregional commodity chains, uh, I do not explain the concept of commodity chain now uh, in detail. I, I presuppose that uh, that you are aware with that concept. Uh, of course, such a chain includes different types of labor regimes uh, uh, in their way from primary materials and manufacturing to marketing and, and distribution. And uh, at each of the different steps of, of manufacturing, uh, we can see different work and labor regimes, paid ones, but also unpaid ones, because unpaid work is uh, in many situations necessary to support uh, the wage workers or the, 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 the remunerated workers. No? Uh, so th so the, I think this synchronicity of commodified and reciprocal work uh, is a key uh, combination. Yeah? Uh, uh, and of in, in various in various forms. I do not go into details here. I just want to say that reciprocal work. Uh, uh, there's no. It doesn't make sense uh, to exclude it from uh, from an anal analysis, uh, even of uh, that that concentrates on on commodified work, uh, because household subsistence, agriculture, uh, are a general precondition for living and reproduction. Uh, uh, and care, yeah? uh, and the type of services, of course, depends on on the temporal and the social social spatial context. Uh, but somehow, this basis of survival has to be uh, guaranteed. Yeah? Uh, and the, the, under specific preconditions, it is necessary uh, to compensate for job insecurity. Yeah? and precarious work for low wages, for lack of social security. And in these situations, uh, reciprocal work uh, gains more importance uh, than in situations where there are other uh, systems of, of, of social uh, security and, 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 and welfare. Yeah? I mean, it's, it's a 
it's common sense, but nevertheless, I want to underline that there's a high female and of course also a high uh, share of the global periphery in reciprocal work. Uh, and it is uh, uh, neglected uh, in global commodity chains and value analysis uh, uh, and uh, it should be included uh, to my mind and in my uh, most recent book about global commodity chains and labor relations. Uh, this was one of the main arguments uh, to, in to include also this uh, uh, reciprocal uh, uh, operations. So now I make a very short jump uh, uh, into uh, my theoretical background yeah? uh, because we, we meet uh, or we encounter value transfers in many respects. I mean, the value transfer that is uh, labeled under surplus value from wage labor, uh, how it is defined uh, uh, by Marx and, and Marxists, uh, uh, where the, so the surplus value is, uh, is, is taken or, uh, from, from, we from, from, the, uh, from free wage labor, it also from forced wage labor, of course, in some situations, and is realized through the employment of a wage laborer. Yeah? Uh, so that is uh, quite common. Huh? Not all, it is all, to a certain extent, it is also taken uh, over by, by liberal uh, uh, authors. Huh? Uh, then, of course, we have another field that uh, I want to leave out for a moment, but of course, we also have to be aware that, uh, that there are other ways of uh, appropriating uh, surplus uh, by drawing rents. Yeah? Uh, uh, in form of the capacity to work, but also uh, uh, various forms of, of, of tribute. Yeah? Uh, but that is also something that, that is acknowledged uh, in the general discussion. What is not so much acknowledged is the fact that we also face transfer value from unpaid work. Yeah? I do not call it surplus value because surplus value, this term is already kind of occupied by the Marxist perspective. Uh, the transfer value from unpaid work is not really conceived of by Marx. I mean, there are some I, moments when, when one could see, say, okay, he was aware also of that unpaid work, but in general, this, this, uh, this unpaid, unpaid work is seen as wor worthless, uh, uh, wertlos uh, uh, in German, so not producing value. Uh, uh, to my mind, it, it is producing value. Of course, then we have to redefine value uh, and it is uh, realized by appropriating unpaid work by various constellations. Yeah? So one is on the fa family level by combining paid and unpaid, pay, unpaid work and labor in the family household of a wage worker uh, who has uh, reciprocal workers behind him or her. Uh, and if it's a single household, uh, this person can be a wage worker and a reciprocal worker at the time and reproducing himself or herself. Uh, but it's not reduced to this uh, household situation because it is also showing up in when different labor relations and conditions uh, and also rent incomes are combined in the framework of commodity chains, as I mentioned before, or also uh, in, 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 in migration. Uh, I come. I now come to to. I mean, my my book uh, uh, is structured into two parts. So the first one is more a conceptual one, which I uh, introduced until now, uh, and then I switch to a second part uh, that goes through various uh, moments of history. Uh, I call it cross cuts. Uh, uh, so it's a it's a chronological. Uh, uh, presentation, but it doesn't cover uh, everything, but it covers uh, uh, key moments uh, that are rough key moments, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, that's how the chapters are organized. And in each of these cross cuts, I look at the synchronicity and combination of labor relations. And it is, uh, I organize the material in the following way, uh, because I mean, it's a, it's a relatively small book uh, with 250 pages or so. Uh, uh, and uh, 
so the question is, how can I write? I do not write a handbook of 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 work yeah? uh, that includes every type of work all over the globe, yeah? uh, and also my expertise would not uh, be enough to 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 cover such a such an uh, to such a uh, claim. Yeah? Uh, so I define my location and I def and I define what I include. Yeah? So from a, on a tem on a thematic level. Uh, I look at the history of interactions and entanglements. Yeah? So how uh, uh, on, on trade relations, on commodity chains, and on and on and on migration, and how different uh, work and labor uh, situations are, are are showing up and combined in this in in these arrangements. Yeah? Uh, on the spatial level, uh, I apply a multi-level system. Yeah? Uh, so I start from from the local, yeah, I mean, the, not really the community, but uh, but the local level, which I define as the Central European region, so uh, where my expertise is uh, located. So it's it's the Habsburg monarchy uh, and its uh, follow-up states, but also uh, uh, other German-speaking regions. Uh, and uh, from here, I start looking at the combination of work and labor relations uh, and then I reach out as far it is, as it is necessary uh, and as, uh, as interactions take place starting from that region. Uh, uh, so uh, I look at the local interactions, I look then at, at, in a second step uh, in each chapter I look at the trans-regional connections which in my uh, context means uh, that uh, within Europe, uh, because also within Europe, of course, uh, I mean, we have many different uh, paths of development, but uh, in, mainly I, I make the differentiation between Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and, and the central, central part. Uh, uh, and then I continue to look at long range transcontinental connections, uh, but always from my location. Uh, uh, so that, of course, means that many interactions that take place in the world are not part of that book. Yeah? But, uh, but this method also shows that we could take uh, another uh, starting point for looking uh, at, at, at these inter interconnections. Yeah? Yeah, we could do it from a Chinese perspective or maybe from a Canadian perspective and so on. Uh, and we would also have inter uh, in, uh, connections, but, but we would have a different uh, starting point and a different perspective on them. So it's it's also a, a, a way that shows uh, an, an encouragement to to organize, uh, let's say, global relations uh, from this uh, multi-level system. Yeah? Then, of course, there are various actors uh, involved, uh, as you can imagine, individual workers, households, that's an important uh, frame. Uh, also, of course, entrepreneurs and companies uh, and uh, the boards of political regulations at different levels also come in uh, uh, because it's not just a, a, a labor or work capital uh, relation, but also the, the, the state on, on, on different uh, levels from the community to the, let's say, global uh, uh, government, uh, governance is, is, is part of that system. Okay, and now we we are ready uh, to to make a, a run through through my cross cuts and you will see we will make it uh, because I will be very brief in the in the in the very in, in, in these cross cuts yeah? uh, uh, so uh, that that also uh, prevents me from going into details which uh, which would need more explanation uh, you you could uh, if you are interested, find that uh, in more detail in the book. So I decided not to start with the 16th century with uh, uh, European expansion, which would be, uh, let's say, let's say a kind of uh, logical moment. Uh, but I, I wanted to start uh, with in the 13th century uh, when we didn't have a modern world system, but an Eurasian world system, which was based on the Pax uh, Mongolica. Yeah? Uh, and this uh, piece, yeah, of, of course, uh, hegemonic piece uh, is not always very 
peaceful for all the participants, but uh, nevertheless, it in enabled long range uh, trade contacts across Eurasia. And uh, Europe, uh, especially Western Europe, was only on the margins of that Eurasian world system. Yeah? Uh, but the contact with, uh, with the, at, at the moment, let's say, core regions of, of, of world uh, manufacture and, and, and trade yeah, uh, was favoring the development of towns, craft and guilds uh, on the western margins of Eurasia. And it was contributing to the division of labor between towns and countryside uh, and gave way to, the, uh, to this urban development and also to this new uh, uh, conception of vocational uh, uh, work that the uh, that, uh, that, uh, that craftsmanship was uh, was characterized of. Yeah? Uh, of course, in this system, uh, there are various forms of wealth transfer and regional imbalances. Yeah? Uh, uh, the, 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 the division of labor, for instance, between nomadic and sedentary population, and also the appropriation uh, of, surpl uh, uh, of, of rents and, and tributes by robbery and enslavement and conquest. Yeah? So there are many stories uh, to be told. Some of them I tell. Yeah? Uh, 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 why I chose this uh, cross cut is, is first to, to, to show a situation where, where, uh, where I, let's say, I clearly show that you cannot just have a Eurocentric story that, uh, that uh, European towns and craftsmanship was at the beginning of, of a new uh, notion of, of work and labor. But this was uh, the result of global interactions uh, that was at the origin of, 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 this, of, of, of developments also in Europe. Uh, uh, and what I also want to show is that uh, we in this, in this system of, uh, of the Eurasian world system, uh, uh, there there, there was a lot of trade, yeah? uh, agricultural goods and craft produce, produce but, uh, but that was final products. Yeah? We, we do not face commodity chains at that, at that moment. Yeah? So the entanglements were based on overlapping circuits of trade and tribute systems. Uh, commodity chains only developed at a later moment. Uh, they developed I would say, uh, I mean, uh, anyhow, it, the commodity chains were not the only uh, organizational uh, structure uh, uh, in, 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 the, in, in global economies. But from, from 1500s onwards, uh, and I, in this case, I, uh, uh, 1500 is my cross cut, but many developments go on until the 1700s until 1700 more or less. Uh, so this cross cut 1500 uh, is related with the European transatlantic expansion. Yeah? And I add regional imbalances within Europe. So as to transatlantic expansion yeah? uh, uh, to the Americas, uh, this is the moment when an, when an unequal division of labor uh, was uh, set up in this uh, 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 triangular trade and, and division of labor, uh, uh, which had a uh, transcontinental character uh, between the, Europe uh, the European uh, manufacture and the raw materials from, from, from the America and the African slaves that were used to produce this, uh, these cash crops. But they also had a regional uh, level. Uh, 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 in the Americas, uh, in this case, I, I look at the at, at, at South America with the colonial plantation complex, complex uh, with slave labor uh, that was combined with the colonial mining complex uh, with uh, 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 various types of forced uh, and dependent labor. Uh, and then, of course, these, uh, these uh, plantation workers, the slaves, but also the miners, uh, they they were in need of, of, of food supply because their households were not uh, able to, to uh, support them with, uh, with or reproduce them. So there was a colonial food supply organized uh, in, in new uh, uh, settings of uh, 
encomienda and reducciones, which built up on, on indigenous uh, uh, work regimes, but introduced them into the, into the colonial uh, uh, complex. Yeah? Uh, so these, I mean, of course, one could say this is nothing special to Central Europe, uh, but it was also uh, Central Europe that uh, was involved in that complex, although uh, its uh, colonial uh, activities were, were, were small, but nevertheless, uh, uh, these products also came into the towns and, and, and crafts uh, in order to be uh, uh, manufactured there. Huh? Uh, so this is the basis on which Western Europe was able to specialize on free tenant farming and on, and, and on export trades while Eastern Europe uh, uh, was in the situation of delivering food and primary goods within the manorial system. Uh, and in, in the middle, in Central Europe, there was a kind of uh, uh, intermediate system uh, based on feudal rent system uh, and regional trades and, 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 and mining. Huh? Uh, so this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling the story here without referring to the theoretical concept behind, which is inspired by, by an, a, a variety of, of world system uh, analysis, but, uh, but uh, uh, not, on the, not only on the global, but also on the, on the regional way. Uh, it's quite clear that the household economy doesn't disappear by this, let's say, uh, development of global uh, interconnection, but it faces transformation. Yeah? Because, and commodification is tapping on reciprocal work for subsistence and reproduction, both in the colonies and in, uh, in, 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 in the European regions. Yeah? And proletarian households at that moment, uh, I mean households that purely rely on wage, uh, labor, income, remain exceptions. Yeah? Of course, there are some examples, uh, uh, but, uh, but that is, uh, that uh, I, that can be seen as an exception. Okay, so I'm moving onwards to 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 the cross cut of 1700, yeah? uh, uh, when global commodity chains uh, became uh, more important for the for the connection for the global connections. Yeah? Uh, but it's uh, it, it's important to see that uh, these commodity chains they changed uh, the place of command or the, the, the uh, uh, I will explain it yeah uh, because uh, I would say uh, until 1700 uh, it was it is it was quite evident that Asian uh, manufacture were the main uh, uh, places of, of of expertise yeah? uh, and the main uh, global commodities were produced in in these regions and and uh, European companies were uh, or traders uh, were the agents to 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 market them on a on a global level. Yeah? Uh, that was changing from 1700 onwards, and I call this uh, import substitution. So this opens a new uh, another field which I only uh, touch briefly uh, because for me the industrial revolution in Europe cannot just be uh, explained from internal uh, developments, but also from this changing situation in, in, the, in the global division of labor, uh, where uh, Asian imports were substituted by, by European uh, uh, manufacture. No? In, in the, around 1700, there was no uh, factory industry yet. Uh, 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 nobody knew that it would come up, uh, but there were regional systems of putting out. Uh, 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 there were European and Asian regional systems. I in introduced uh, some of them. Uh, and uh, of course, they were similar to, uh, to, to, I mean, they were commodity chains. Yeah? Uh, I see the putting out as a variety of, as an early variety of, of commodity chains. So they were combining production sites in chains, yeah? combining different locations with different forms of labor. And these commodity chains were serving as a 
vehicle to transfer value from the low ends to the high ends of these commodity chains. So beside the local and regional chains, uh, uh, I think this, uh, this uh, trans-regional uh, uh, trading uh, companies like the uh, East Indian Company or the uh, Vereinigte Ostendische Company uh, and of course also France and even uh, Habsburg monarchy had such companies and some other uh, states too. Uh, they built up global systems of putting out, yeah? uh, building up on Asian producers, producers and trade networks. Yeah? European traders entered these uh, Asian trade networks. Yeah? The, the, the imports were not only uh, consumed and traded in, 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 the, in, the, in, in in the respective states, but they were used as re-export products uh, on the one hand to, to buy uh, slaves and on the other hand to, to, to be sold in the, in the Americas, for instance. Uh, and uh, in, the, in, the co in the course of history, you could see this transition from cooperation between these Asian producers uh, and the Western merchants who traded uh, the Asian products on global markets towards the Western dominance of these commodity chains. And in the next step, uh, Western European manufacture was replacing imports uh, from Asia. Uh, and from 1700 onwards, you could see step by step the substitution of Asian manufacture imports by uh, European uh, uh, produced products. Uh, of course, that needed protection of the inter internal markets uh, from this uh, Asian competition uh, until uh, enough expertise was uh, 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 developed in order to, to, to conquest also this, uh, uh, the, the, the former Asian export markets as well as the Asian markets themselves. That is a complicated story and very interesting depending on the commodity on which we are looking, but I will not go into detail, but jump to the cost cut, cost cut 1800, which of course is a very important moment in the history of work and labor that everybody acknowledges because that is the moment when the factory labor uh, uh, became more and more dominant. Uh, of course, not uh, at, from one day to the other, but but that's 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 the moment when the when the factory system was introduced. Uh, uh, but we do not only face the introduction of the of, of factory labor as a new dominant type of labor. Factory labor uh, also uh, brought with it a new type of housework. Uh, so we had central the centralization of industrial labor in factories. Uh, but at the same time, we had the development of house and subsistence work as a uh, uh, precondition for the factory workers to survive. Uh, uh, although this work was denied to be labor and to create value, as, as I mentioned before. Uh, uh, it is quite important to see uh, the, 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 the coexistence of, of family members in, in household, uh, households which uh, to a certain extent lost uh, their capacity of, of being uh, uh, household economies, uh, uh, but still uh, went on to be income pooling units where different uh, uh, earnings and, and results of, of work and labor were, were pooled in order to survive the, 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 the the family, the, the family or the household members, sometimes also non-family members. So you could see local, local combinations yeah? uh, because, for instance, uh, subsistence farming of cottages uh, uh, was uh, going hand in hand uh, with, with factory work. Yeah? Also, factory workers at the beginning uh, uh, often had their small plot uh, of, of, of garden or little land in order to produce their own uh, food. Yeah? Uh, and you could, face, uh, you could face this combination not only on the local level, but also uh, on the level of, of labor migration, a kind of complementary migration. Yeah? Some family members went 
into migra into into labor migration uh, they went in order to stay to make the family stay in their original surrounding uh, and translocal households were developing sometimes losing this translocality and moving uh, to the to the to the regions of, 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 of growth and, 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 and to the urban regions. But very often and for a long time, uh, these, trocal, uh, these connections with the, with the home uh, uh, household was maintained and, and guaranteed the, the let's say, uh, uh, transfer, transfer of values uh, in, in this and that direction. On the one hand, uh, the wage workers uh, supporting the households with uh, monetary income and on the other hand the household supporting the wage workers with with care in many situations when they lost uh, 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 their job or when they fell ill uh, in times when no social uh, security systems were yet available you know? and then of course uh, we could also look at the combination of factory labor uh, which did not end slave labor uh, but uh, 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 in, in, in many cases, the fact that the cotton industry is a very good example that, uh, that the rise of the cotton uh, factories, the spinning mills, uh, also was the moment uh, for an expansion of, of, of uh, plantation slavery, uh, which is often uh, labeled second slavery, uh, with uh, more strict uh, uh, mechanisms of, of, of exploitation. Yeah? So, the rise of factory labor was not, uh, uh, it cannot be seen as a single phenomenon, but it was uh, uh, linked with new combinations of paid, unpaid, and, and forced work. Okay, so now I'm, I have two more crosscuts, 1900. Uh, uh, that, uh, that is the moment when this reduction of work to gainful employment really became uh, dominant yeah? uh, in the already in the course of the second half of the 19th century we saw a lot of regulation codification and also of social security systems uh, developing especially in the industrialized west in the in those regions where the factory system uh, was established uh, and there were a lot of legal and statistical and li linguistic definitions uh, what work was yeah? uh, and it was also uh, uh, there were also questions of uh, what kind of work entitled to social benefits yeah? and there were a lot of steps of inclusions of different types of workers into the system of social security but this inclusions at the same time was a means of exclusions yeah? and these delimitations between work and non-work became a big issue yeah? Uh, so a lot of workers found themselves in the situation that they that their work was not uh, uh, considered work anymore. Yeah? Uh, uh, that started already with the separation of the house uh, of the workplace and the and the working uh, uh, the, the living place and the working place, but now it affected more and more people. Uh, and but this codification yeah, and this strict definition uh, contradicted with the real life experience of a lot of people i would say of most people yeah? uh, uh, they, they, it, it was even determining the identity and the social entitlement uh, for those people who did not have a formalized employment uh, uh, but uh, de facto uh, people were, were, were we were forced to combine employment, subsistence, makeshifts with public transfers, often in translocal households. And this was not only uh, in colonies or developing countries or so, uh, but in industrialized countries too. And even if we look at the industrial, industrialized regions, we find very few uh, where this ideal of stable, decently paid and socially secured employment uh, became a dominant feature. Uh, uh, usually uh, this, uh, uh, this unpaid, underpaid, informal, precarious uh, uh, work uh, constellations uh, were, were, were still uh, surviving and are still uh, surviving. Uh, and now I come uh, to the end. 
uh, I mean, I would say uh, from the 1980s onwards, what one could say we are moving back to normal. Uh, we had an exception from the, let's say, 1880s maybe to the 1980s, uh, when we had uh, the capitalist and state socialist welfare states, I mean the state socialist welfare states only at this uh, later moment, uh, uh, but they were characterized by the expansion of wage labor combined with, uh, with growing uh, uh, social uh, elements of social security. Yeah? Uh, the household was still important, uh, reproduction in the household, but the household respons responsibilities were shifting away from material to immaterial subsistence. Not in every crisis, not in every region, but as a general uh, tendency. Yeah? In, also in the third world, of course, in the course of the 20th century, uh, we could see an expansion of wage labor. But there it was without job and social security and household subsistence, informal economy and uh, labor migration compensated for these uh, deficiencies of, 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 of the lack of social, uh, social security. And then I would say this, the global economic crisis of the 1970s, uh, at the end of the uh, post-war reconstruction period, was, uh, I see it as a turning point uh, that after a while gave way to this new international division of labor uh, that was linked with the relocation of mass industry to newly industrial, industrializing countries. Uh, and there it was th these new these industries this, uh, 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 were tapping into the reciprocal economy by employing single household mem members who at the same time were embedded into this uh, 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 reciprocal context uh, of the family households who sometimes uh, also had to migrate in order to support these households. Yeah? Of, then I just uh, sum up uh, some of these uh, new features, the restructuring of global commodity chains, the, the whole rationalization, digi digitalization, and the new knowledge-based industry uh, uh, as one major response to overcome the global crisis. Uh, leading also to new types of, of governance and supranational organizations uh, who were uh, accompanying uh, the processes of deregulation and, and fiscal austerity, usually called neoliberalism. Uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, on the level of, of, of work organization, we could also see deregulation and informalization and social, social fragmentation of of, 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 of class uh, uh, in the old industrial countries. I do not speak of, uh, I do not go into details of that social fragmentation. That is something that we, uh, we, we can see, uh, study today. I, w I just want to uh, conclude with, with uh, jumping, let's say, over the latest developments uh, to a certain extent and ask this question, uh, uh, of, a, of the likelihood or not uh, of a workless future. Uh, uh, and I look back again at these exceptional periods of the 1880s to the 1980s, roughly spoken, when we got used to gainful employment uh, that was regulated by labor laws that entitled to social security in the global north, uh, uh, neglecting uh, subsistence in informal work, especially in the south, but also in the north, uh, uh, with the illusion and maybe the promise that uh, uh, step by step uh, these uh, older forms of, of work would be overcome by, uh, by complete uh, commodification. Yeah? And then from the 1980s onwards, as I pointed out, informality, precarity, and uh, social insecurity were returning to the global north. Uh, uh, I didn't explain the mechanism how this global uh, competition now uh, 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 was, was uh, let's say, striking back uh, to the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the industrialized, uh, uh, developed world. Uh, uh, we had we faced this automate, automized, automation and digitalization uh, uh, 
that are changing the labor market and were eventually causing technological unemployment, uh, but they did not make work disappear. Uh. Even the, the new developments uh, of, of, of uh, 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 the, 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 artificial intelligence and so on do not make work disappear. Yeah? We face a rise. It, it depends, of course, how, how you define work. Uh, but in, in the definition I gave and this broad understanding of work, we face a rise of housework. Yeah? Housework is, has many uh, manifestations. In some regions, it's it can be subsistence agriculture and, and, and very much linked with physical uh, operations. But in other uh, circumstances, it is moving towards self-styling, uh, self-styling, but also family support in order to, to, to support and uh, living and to make a career in a competitive uh, society. Uh, it is uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so, uh, there's also a rise of subsistence care and community work uh, in those cases where, uh, where low wages or also no wages uh, uh, require more non-paid work. Uh, and I think it's also important to see that shadow work, uh, I use this uh, 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 expression that Ivan Illich uh, uh, was giving uh, uh, but also others uh, were building up on this type of shadow work uh, th that uh, a lot of, uh, of, of, of paid, uh, I mean, now we can see that a lot of paid services, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, carried out by state and bank employees or by people on the cash, cash in the supermarkets and so on, uh, uh, they they are replaced by our own private uh, activity. Uh, in most cases, it's e-activity, electronic activity. Uh, uh, we might not consider it uh, work, but as it is substituting uh, commodi uh, commodified uh, uh, work, I would say it's a substitution of 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 non-paid work, which I would not call reciprocal, and uh, but rather refer to the to the to this term of of shadow work. I know that there are also other expressions for for this development, which is, I think, very near to our to our reality. Yeah? So my conclusion is that work is expanding and multiplying, and it is quite obvious after after this exceptional period where one could have the impression that the tendency of commodification would take over, that now with the de deregulation, uh, 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 it, it is shifting uh, from a narrow understanding uh, of work equal gainful employment to a broad variety of activities, paid and unpaid, uh, uh, that are characterized by social fragmentation and big uncertainty. Uh, the workless future could be uh, a discussion that I do not want to start here, uh, but at the end, just uh, refer to to the cover page of, uh, of the book work, uh, which would answer <laughs> all those questions uh, that I ra raised in, in my talk. But of course, I'm here and I'm ready to answer your questions already now. Thank you very, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. It's a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, I'll just stop the sharing of the screen.